toupees. They really do come in all shapes and sizes. As if to prove the point, take the latest BMW 2 Series, which is more of a two-door saloon than a sleek and rakish coupe. However, the 2 Series has always been one of our favourite driver's cars, particularly in flagship M2 competition guys. Now, the M2 version of this new car is still a little way off. So, to whet our appetite, here's the new M240i, now with xDrive four-wheel drive for the first time. Now, four-wheel drive is also what the Mercedes-AMG CLA 45S has got. It's also got four doors, which makes it a strange sort of coupe. Yet you're willing to overlook this when you also consider it has 415 brake horsepower, which is over 100 horsepower more than the entry-level Porsche Cayman. Yet with its mid-engine layout, two-wheel drive, two seats and lowest curb weight, it's arguably the purest driver's car of the lot. So which of these sports coupes is our favourite? Well, let's find out. So welcome to Snowdonia and welcome also to the new 2 Series, specifically the 2 Series in range topping M240i trim. Now this car's a big deal and it's also a relief. It's a big deal because BMW Performance Coupes tend to be pretty good and we look forward to them. It's a relief because ever since the current 1 Series arrived on its front driven platform, there have been question marks about whether the 2 Series was also going to move on to a, a front-driven platform. What didn't help matters was that when the 2 Series Grand Coupe arrived, also on the front-driven platform of the 1 Series, and I, I think at that point, a lot of us started to get a little bit jittery, but no, here it is, the 2 Series, on the same platform as the 3 and the 4 Series, natively rear-driven, although this one's X-Drive, so four-wheel drive, longitudinally engined, so you get four cylinders lower down the range, but this range-topping 240i is a B58 six-cylinder, so the same engine you find in the Supra and in faster versions of the, the 3 and the 4 series. And this will be the hottest 2 series until the M2 arrives later this year. So the aim today is to get to know the M240i a little bit better on British roads. We've already driven it in Germany, quite liked it, but obviously British B roads, especially roads to the one to Snowdonia, very much the acid test for cars like this. And we've also brought along a couple of its classmates. So my colleague James Disdale is somewhere behind us or in front of us, I'm not sure where. He's in a basic Porsche 718 Cayman. And that's an interesting rival because at 46,000 pounds, it is more or less exactly the same price as this M240i. Neither of the cars are quite standard, they're not quite basic, but you're not going to consider one of these cars without the other. So we brought it along to see how they compare. The other car, uh, which is being driven by Matt Pryor, is the Mercedes AMG CLA 45 Plus. Now I know some of you will be raising eyebrows because that car is a little bit more expensive. It starts at around 56,000 pounds. But we've brought it along because the Porsche is a proper driver's car. The BMW, we hope, is a proper driver's car. And the CLA 45 is also a proper driver's car in a way that the 35 isn't. So the thing about the new M240i is it's actually got quite a lot more serious since the last generation. The footprint's grown a bit, as you'd expect. But in dynamic terms, what's much more meaningful is the contact patch, which has also grown. It's actually pretty similar now to um, what you'd find on the original M2, so the pre-competition M2. Power as well is up, obviously, around 370 brake horsepower. So this is now a very, very powerful car with a big contact patch and four-wheel drive. So you would expect the performance levels to be pretty stratospheric, and, and without wanting to go too OTT about it, they really are. Let's talk about the powertrain because I think this is the one area in which any owners of the old car upgrading this car are going to notice straight away what the changes are. Obviously you've got more power and torque, but it's the gearbox that is blowing me away to be honest. ZF and BMW have worked for a long time on this 8-speed torque converter and they've now got the technology so good that they're actually willing to put it in an M3. And the shit in this car. This isn't precisely the same gearbox as you'll find in an M3. It couldn't cope with that level of torque, but it's the same technology. So this thing will pop in upshifts. Let's just 
to that downshift. Fourth gear. Third gear. Let's go up again. They're still not quite dual clutch quick, but honestly, they're probably to within 10% of what you'd expect from a really good dual clutch box. It just raises the level of intent in this car quite a lot. Engine-wise, this B58 straight six is, is a known quantity and also a, a much-loved one. It's popped up in, in many of the fastest non-M BMWs for years now. It's just got an endlessly wide torque band, but it's also got a pretty decent top end. Revs to six and a half thousand. Again, get there, pull a paddle, or not, let the gearbox sort it out, but the upshift is absolutely spotless. Sometimes Mercedes, their MCT gearboxes, can really fluff their lines if you uh, upshift anywhere near the red line. Not so with this ZF box, it's a real, real operator. So let's see what this car can do. I've got it in sport individual with the steering in comfort. I've got the dampers in sport. I've got the engine obviously in its most aggressive mode. I have to say, brakes are a bit soft. Turning is really nicely judged though. It's got a slightly languid GT car feel. I, I mean, the Porsche is gonna feel a lot sharper than this on turning, but this feels really nicely judged. Typical BMW, there's not actually an awful lot of steering feel, but that's not translating into a lack of confidence, which is quite nice. It's quite light off center, and then the weight comes in. It is nice, it's nicely suited. Throttle response, good, very good. I don't know how much more this, this straight six, this B58 has to give, probably quite a lot. So the fact that it's running in a reasonably relaxed state of tune means that they can really, really prioritize that throttle response. Again, the brakes, I'm not totally convinced by the brakes. I think they do a, they do a reasonably good job, but you can't really lean on them. I know for a fact that in the Porsche, you get a really nice wall of resistance that you've just got to push through. I tell you what though, it is starting to spit here and the traction of this X-Drive driveline is immense. Not really surprising, you've got that new contact patch and the X-Drive system is permanent. It's always operating. What else do I like? Damping. It's quite a heavy car, you can feel that, but there's a real sophistication in the body movements that you don't actually always get with cars sort of in the sub 50,000 pound mark, especially the big volume ones. A bit earlier when we were driving down this road, I had the dampers still in comfort. And to be honest, the car was still holding itself together pretty well. It was only when you really start to push on a bit and, and start to engage that M Sport differential in the back of it, or especially mid corner. The rear outside of the car would sort of uh, collapse a little bit uncomfortably, and the car would get into a little bit of roll over steer territory, which is obviously good fun, but not always what you want when you're sight reading a road. I have to say, just knock the dampers up into sport, it's completely cured that. I think if you were to come into this car fresh with sort of no preconceptions, you'd find that it was really, really nicely balanced. It was very satisfying. One of the other nice things that doesn't seem to have been hurt too much by, by the inclusion of X-Drive is that this car's still got that slightly one-dimensional but really satisfying throttle adjustability that you get in fast BMW coupes. It's never gonna tuck its nose in mid-corner with a lift of the throttle like the Porsche will. But if you get the car into the corner and get it balanced up and just begin to squeeze the throttle, it moves from the back first and foremost. It's obviously been set up really carefully, this car. And the result is a car that gives you a lot of four-wheel drive security and a lot of rear-wheel drive playfulness. Again, it's the kind of blend that people who don't necessarily want something as hardcore as a full M offering are gonna be quite grateful for, and it works really nicely in the M240i. The differential, the M Sport diff in the back axle is really integral to that. It's really clean acting, really predictable. It just feels like a very mature and sophisticated car. And I think we can probably forget the notion of, of uh, you know, this being an 
M Lite and the somehow junior and inferior offering to the M2. I think it's going to be, it's not going to be as quick or precise as the M2, but for what it's designed to be, a little bit more GT in its DNA. It's very, very versatile. And I think its limits are in a really nice place. It just seems to, again, grip and slip in exactly the places you'd want it to for a, for a sort of sub M performance car. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, James Disdale now, he's going to tell you a little bit about the Porsche and uh, on the basis that when I saw him earlier, he was positively salivating about it. I'm sure he'll give you some very good reasons why you should buy that car instead of this, but I think in the cold light of day, this is a very difficult car to beat this new M240i. The Porsche 718 Cayman costs just over £46,000, or £48,000 if fitted with our car's 7-speed PDK twin-clutch gearbox. For that, you get a turbocharged 2-litre flat 4 that delivers 296 brake horsepower and 280 pounds foot of torque. 0 to 62 takes 4.9 seconds, which drops to 4.7 seconds when you have the optional Sport Chrono Pack. Top speed is 170 miles an hour. So the Porsche Cayman, in some ways, is a bit of an outlier in this group. The other two are spun-off family cars, basically. You've got the Mercedes, which is effectively a hatchback underneath, and the 2 Series is a shortened 3 Series Executive Saloon, but this is a proper bespoke sports car. It's a bespoke chassis. It's a mid-engine layout, rear-wheel drive. Now, obviously, that means there are some compromises. We haven't got any rear seats. Now, if that's a consideration, stop here. We don't need to talk about the Cayman anymore. But look beyond that, and the Cayman's actually quite sensible. It's got the best driving position, I think, of the three. Sit nice and low. There's plenty of space in here, and it's actually surprisingly practical. There's a big boot at the front hatchback at the rear, it's pretty good. Now, weirdly, being the sports car, the Porsche is quite heavily outgunned by the other two, and by quite a lot. So this two litre flat four is 296 brake horsepower. That's well over 100 brake horsepower down on the Mercedes, and not far short again with the BMW. It's also, well, there's the sound, isn't there? I know we're gonna have to talk about it, fact is we've been going on and on about it not being a six cylinder for a long time and in many respects most people have got used to it and you can see why because yes it's down on power but the turbocharger means there's lots and lots of torque there's been some changes to it recently so it's had a gasoline particulate filter and some changes to the tuning to meet various emissions regulations so compared to the early cars it feels a bit gutless low down, below 3,000, there's not a lot going on, but once it gets some revs on, it actually goes well. And let's not forget, it's well, it's just under 1,400 kilos, the Cayman, so it's quite a lot lighter than the other two. So while it does lack outright performance, and if you read the official 0-60 specs, it's absolutely rinsed by the other two, but on the road, once it's rolling, well, it's not slow, and the noise, Yes, when it first came out, that kind of gruff, grumpy sound wasn't a patch on the old flat six, but it is at least authentic. Even the BMW, the six cylinder BMW, there's, there's kind of an edge of synthesis to it that it doesn't feel entirely natural. Whereas this is, with a sports exhaust as well, it's a real engine sound. No, it's not a particularly uplifting one, but it's a real internal combustion engine. When it's paired with this seven speed PDK gearbox, you can absolutely cover ground at an astonishing rate. Now, I'll be honest, I'd quite like to have a manual in a Cayman. Feels more like a proper driver's car, but this seven speed is so good. You really don't miss, for most of the time, a manual gearbox. It's so fast, so precise, that you can just barrel up to corners, haul on the brakes, rattle down a few gears, and it does it almost seamlessly. It allows you just to keep your hands on the wheel, and concentrate on the road. It's not a hindrance, it just allows you to go faster, safer. But of course, what makes the Porsche the car it is, what makes it unequivocally the best driver's car here is the chassis. As I say, that mid-engine layout gives it a near perfect 50-50 weight distribution. And the way it stitches together a road like this is just sublime. The other two, they can really 
get from point A to point B very, very quickly, as can this. And probably when the going gets really slippery and twisty, the other two would probably show this a clean pair of heels, but not by much. But you'd be having way more fun in this. The steering is just perfect. It's fast, but not too fast. It's got a, just a beautifully geared rate of response. So you just roll into a corner and there's just enough feedback. They filter out the stuff you don't need to know, but keep in the stuff you do. After drives in the other two, it's a revelation. And then there's a the suspension. Now, this car's got a few bits going on. So we've got the adaptive dampers, we've got the torque vectoring rear diff, but we've driven enough Caymans without those bits to know that the base car is just as good. You can just load it up in the corner and you feel each axle taking its share of the cornering forces. You know exactly where you are, the feedback you get through the wheel and the seat of your pants. And you can play with the balance, just a little lift of the throttle, a little stab of the throttle, a little tweak of the wheel and the car's attitude just shifts subtly. It's a car you don't have to be driving like your hair is on fire, if you had some, to really enjoy. It's a car that rewards at any speed. And then there are the brakes. Now, the other two, they're either a bit soft or a bit grabby, depending on where you are in the travel. With the Porsche, you can just lean on the brakes as hard as you want. The pedal progression is perfect. The power is immense. And this is just an entry-level Cayman braking setup. You can just feel exactly where you are in terms of the grip you've got when leaning hard onto the brakes into a corner. And yes, we've got those adaptive dampers, but they are superb. They're just over a thousand pounds or so. If you can tick that box, do it, because the body control is just incredible. You can select between normal and sport, and on the road, sport is fine, it's firm, it's never jarring, but frankly, most of the time, just leave it in comfort, let it do its own thing. The car just corners, flat, fuss-free. It's firm over bigger stuff at slow speed, but it's never uncomfortable. It just rounds off all the edges. The money that Porsche must have spent on this damping, you feel it compared to the other two. The whole suspension just feels like next level investment. As a driver's car, the Cayman, there's still not a lot that can touch it really. The other two are faster and obviously they're more useful. And I don't know how that shakes out in the overall scheme of things the big verdict. But if all you want to do is drive and enjoy driving, this is the car. The Mercedes AMG CLA 45S comes in at a whisker under 61,000 pounds. Yikes. But for that, you do get a turbocharged two litre four cylinder engine that delivers a remarkable 415 brake horsepower and 369 pounds foot of torque. That means 0 to 62 miles an hour in just four seconds and a top speed of 168 miles an hour. So welcome to the inside of the Mercedes CLA AMG A45. Mercedes AMG CLA A45, whatever, it's, it's the Mercedes. And I like it in here, it's pretty nice. It's not the latest generation of Mercedes interior, in fact, and for some, in some respects, I think it's, it's better for it. I get it's a very good driving position, very straight, really figure-hugging seats, which is nice, and it's a really pleasant, dash layout with these vents that sort of look like sort of turbine blades. I think they're really, they're really cool. But most significantly, when it comes to being inside it, it gets a, a slightly previous generation infotainment system. It does rattle a bit, I don't know if you can hear that. Which means I, I get a touch screen there, but it's also controllable by a touch pad on here, which I've got something to rest my wrist on. And I can also control it via a little swipey thing on here and the rest of the steering wheel has proper buttons. It's actually very sensible, very easy to use. You can set up these little shortcuts down here on the steering wheel to do different things. So, for example, I can have a shortcut to the electric dynamic mode, accessibility off, exhaust loud, or, as I prefer to keep it in, manual gearbox, and then this other one controls the dampers. But I tend to leave those in comfort for the reasons I will come to in a moment. And so, to the performance, this is the most powerful car here. It's the only one with a power figure that starts with a, with a four. It's got a very high specific output four-cylinder engine. 
because AMG is all about engines, as you'll know. So, 38 miles an hour. Second gear takes it to almost 60, takes about 50, 55, something like that. It's a very high revving. It's not the world's most sonorous four-cylinder, but it's not a bad sound. But as you'll know, as with most cars, performance cars, they're too fast for the road. So actually you can't be in the upper echelons of the rev range in third, fourth, fifth, whatever. So what I tend to do, and the engine response is, is nice around, around those areas is be sort of through the mid range in third, fourth, fifth, and then between sort of 40 and 60 miles an hour, which is your typical driving speed. That's where it sits. It, it thrums along quite nicely. And also it doesn't trouble the gearbox too much because you're not always asking for rapid gear shifts. And this box is not the world's quickest and smoothest. And as you may have heard when I changed up from second, let's just try that again. If I go up to the to, towards the top of the red line in second and ask for change. There we go. It took quite a long time to go from one to the other. So the gearbox is not its strong point. But the engine response is good and the sound is quite zingy and responsive and it's just I mean it's quick, no denying. In this company, it's a fast car. And when it comes to the ride and handling, well I like it. I like it. It's quite firm. It, it lacks some of the suppleness that you'd get in other cars in this class. It is, it is, it is pretty, pretty stiff. For the road in the UK, particularly, you might as well have the, the dampers in their comfort mode. They also have a sport mode, which actually is 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 fine. It doesn't make the ride too much harsher. There's a sport plus. And I think you'd reserve that for the racetrack. Really, it's that becomes really sort of pattery and brittle. But in comfort, it gives the wheels a little bit of movement, a little bit of breath but body control is really tight. Lean is limited, dive is limited. Steering, I like very much. It's got a really nice build up of weight just off straight ahead. It feels really keyed in and turning. It's not unlike, and I mean this as a, as a compliment, it's not unlike a sort of Porsche 911 rack in, in that it's, in that it's, it just takes up weight really nicely. It's super accurate and linear. It's very, very good. The handling balance, tends towards sort of the front first it feels it feels like it goes up to the limit of adhesion in the front first and then it starts to worry about the back uh, by applying power that 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 way it doesn't feel like a, a four-wheel drive system that's 50 50 or inherently rear biased it's very much a sort of front led car with the stability and security pushed in from the rear when it when it needs it all in all it's actually quite a good car it's an entertaining car, it's a good car, it's a really, really capable car. Quite a lot of time for it. Whether it's quite as finessed, I think, in terms of ride and handling balance as the others, well, that I'm not quite so convinced about. But driven in isolation, it's a really good thing. OK, so where does that leave us? Well, in many respects, you pay your money and you make your choice. The BMW? Well, we loved its snarling straight six, its performance, its driver engagement, and its ability to perform as a mini GT car. With the Mercedes, it's the blistering performance and the staggering cross-country pace that really impresses, even if it is a little hardcore for day-to-day -day use. But ultimately, if you're looking for the ultimate sports coupe, the one that gets your heart racing the fastest, the one that you want to grab the keys to and take for a drive at any time of day or night, well, it has to be the Porsche Cayman which is so wonderful to drive, you're even willing to forgive it that farty flat four engine. And don't forget, if you like this video, to hit like, subscribe, and smash that notifications button so you never miss another Autocar video.